Today's lesson is on exchange rates, trade, and economic sanctions. If you are looking at the Econ 201 syllabus, this lesson constitutes all of Lesson 23 and half of Lesson 24. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain how strong or weak currencies affect imports and exports, and explain how nations use economic sanctions and economic aid as instruments of power to support their national interests. To learn more about these topics, I recommend you read the Blackboard lesson notes on international trade and economic sanctions, which are pages 53 to 54 of the Blackboard lesson notes PDF file. I also recommend you read sections 23.1, 23.5, 23.6, 29.1, and 29.3 of your online textbook. This lesson also has a Kahoot attached to it. If you pause this video, you can write down the link to the Kahoot. In the slides that follow, we will go over the Kahoot questions and answers. This table reports the value of the US dollar in terms of other currencies. Each of these values is called an exchange rate. An exchange rate is just a price. It is a price of one currency in terms of another. For example, using this table, if you were to go on a vacation to Mexico and exchange your dollars for Mexican pesos, you would get 22 and a half pesos for each dollar that you exchange. Another way to think about this is that you can purchase one peso for about four cents. You can see that the dollar is worth very different amounts of other countries' currencies. Some of these differences stem from different units of measurement for their currencies that other countries use. The value of different countries' currencies relative to the dollar can also reflect the strength of another country's economy relative to the U.S. economy, as well as what their past and current rates of inflation are relative to inflation in the U.S. In the slides that follow, we are going to think about how the value of a country's currency affects other aspects of its economy, particularly its trade balance. These are the same questions that are in the Kahoot, so you can go through them here, or if you prefer, you can play the Kahoot. Let's get started. I used to travel to the United Kingdom frequently for work. When I did that, I could usually count on a pound being worth about $1.50. When that was true, how many pounds was one dollar worth? Feel free to pause the video if you want to take a moment to work out the answer. The answer is that one dollar was worth about 0.67 pounds. To see why, note that to change a dollar fifty to a dollar, we need to divide by 1.5. Since we have to do the same thing to both sides of the equation to maintain equality, we also divide one pound by 1.5, which tells us that one dollar is worth about 0.67 of a pound. Let's move on. Now, one pound is worth a dollar 23. What has happened to the value of the pound relative to the dollar? The answer is that the value of the pound has decreased relative to the value of the dollar. This is because the pound is worth less in dollars than it used to be. When one currency's value has fallen relative to another's, we say that it has depreciated or gotten weaker. Next question. If the pound used to be worth $1.50 and now it is worth $1.23, what has happened to the value of the dollar relative to the pound? The answer is that the value of the dollar has increased relative to the pound. Because the pound is worth less in dollars than it used to be, that means that each dollar is now worth more in pounds. Therefore, the value of the dollar relative to the pound has increased. When the value of one currency increases relative to another, we say that that currency has appreciated or gotten stronger. Would you rather be a tourist in the UK when the pound is worth $1.23 
or when the pound is worth $1.50. I hope that you chose that you would rather be a tourist in the UK when the pound is worth $1.23. The reason why is that when each pound is cheaper for you, meaning that it costs less in terms of dollars, the cost of other things like meals and hotel rooms, which will also be priced in pounds, is also less for you. Your tourist dollars will go farther in the UK when the pound costs $1.23. Let's think about this problem from the perspective of a British tourist traveling in the U.S. Would you rather be a British tourist in the U.S. when the pound is worth $1.23 or $1.50? Here, I hope you chose $1.50. When pounds are worth more in dollars, dollars are cheaper for British tourists in the U.S. So are U.S. goods and services. So a British tourist money will go farther in the U.S. when their pounds are worth more. What applies to tourists applies equally well to the value of a country's imports and its exports. We are going to explore this relationship next. First, however, we're going to start with a little review. Your first review question is, the value of the goods and services that a country sells to other countries is called its what? The answer is that the value of goods and services that a country sells to other countries is called its exports. Next review question. The value of the goods and services that a country buys from other countries is called its what? This time the answer is that the value of the goods and services that a country buys from other countries is called its imports. Last review question. A country's balance of trade is defined by which of the following equations? The answer is that a country's balance of trade is defined as its exports minus its imports. If a country is running a trade surplus, then which of these four things is true? If a country is running a trade surplus, then its exports are greater than its imports. Although it may be true that its exports are growing, or its imports are falling, or both, in order to have a trade surplus, by definition, its total exports need to be bigger than its total imports. If a country is running a trade deficit, then which of these things is true? The answer is that if a country is running a trade deficit, then it is importing more than it is exporting. Note that this could be caused by falling exports, increasing imports, or both, but in order to be a trade deficit, Total imports need to be greater than total exports. Next question. True or false, it is better for a country to run a trade surplus than a trade deficit. The answer is that this statement is false. Note that just because this statement is false does not mean that it is better for a country to run a trade deficit either. One is not necessarily better or worse than the other, which is why the answer to this question is false. We could consider the case of Japan. Japan has run a large trade surplus for many years, but its economy has also been relatively stagnant for a long time. Trade surpluses are not necessarily good for a country, and trade deficits are not necessarily bad either. We could also consider the case of the United States. In the U.S., we have been consistently running trade deficits since the 1980s, but our economy has done pretty well over most of that time. In part, a country's trade balance reflects the value of its currency relative to other currencies. We are going to explore this relationship next. 
if a country's currency gets stronger, then which of these things is true? The correct answer is all of these things are true. Let's think about why this is the case. If a country's currency strengthens, then its exported goods are more expensive for people in other countries to buy. Thus, the quantity demand for these exported goods will fall, and total exports will fall as well. By the same token, if a country's currency is strong, then imported goods are going to be cheaper for residents of that country to buy. We would expect to see quantity demanded of imported goods rise and total imports to rise as well. Overall, the increase in the quantity of imports and the decrease in the quantity of exports will cause a country's trade deficit to increase or, if it's running a trade surplus, we would expect the trade surplus to fall. Having a strong currency can be a mixed bag. In general, if a country's currency is getting stronger, that partially reflects the fact that its economy is doing well relative to the economies of other countries in the world. One downside of having a strong currency, however, is that it can cause a country's trade deficit to grow or its trade surplus to shrink. The other thing that the value of a country's currency reflects is how attractive it is to international investors. The U.S. is very attractive to international investors. This is one reason why the value of the dollar is relatively strong. However, the fact that we attract lots of foreign investment funds also has a tendency to make our trade deficit larger. If a country's currency gets weaker, then which of these things will be true? Again, the answer is all of the above. You should not be surprised to learn that if a country's currency gets weaker, then the reverse of what we discussed for strong currencies happens. We can apply this situation to China. If you go to this Wall Street Journal article, you will learn that the U.S. has recently dropped its designation of China as a currency manipulator. If the U.S. believes that a country is keeping the value of its currency artificially low in order to keep its exports cheap, it will designate them as a currency manipulator. Usually, being named a currency manipulator comes with some sort of trade sanctions, such as increased tariffs on goods coming from that country. As you read this article, think about why China might want to keep the value of its currency low and why the U.S. might have a problem with China's doing this. Last question. Which of the following are sanctions that the U.S. currently has in place? You are probably not surprised that the answer to this question is all of the above. Note that we have done all three of these things in the interests of national security. Sometimes we use economic tools to meet national security goals. You can see a complete list of economic sanctions that the U.S. currently has in place at this website. There are five types of limitations on trade that a country can impose. Tariffs and quotas are typically implemented more for economic reasons than for national security reasons. Export limitations can be placed on certain types of goods for national security reasons. For example, we might not allow some types of goods to be exported at all, or we might allow them to only be sold to our closest allies. Embargoes and blockades are also usually employed to attain certain national security or foreign policy goals. Because blockades are often considered to be acts of war, we typically use them only in very extreme circumstances, such as when we are already at war with another country. This concludes this lesson on exchange rates, trade, and economic sanctions. To learn more, take a look at the recommended reading and the websites and articles linked in these slides.